This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by Hi.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hi.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastien Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by Scott and Claire from the law firm KWM in Australia. This is a global law firm. And Scott is partner at this particular law firm, King & Wood Melson. He has been practicing in financial markets and financial systems for 20 years including the creation of new financial market infrastructure. Claire is a senior associate at KWM, specializing in capital markets, derivatives, structured products, clear clearing and derivatives regulation. They have together come up with an idea called DNA contracts that mixes digital and analog terms in order to form a new kind of, let's say, smart contract. So we'll be walking about what these DNA contracts are and what they can enable. But before we start, Let's have a bit of background about KWM and uh, and our interviewees. So Scott, if you could give a bit of background. Sure, thank you. King & Wood Mallisons is a global law firm which has a very strong presence in Asia. We have uh, more than 150 partners in China, for example, um, and as well we have uh, more than 150 in Australia. We have a similar amount in Europe as well. We work for both global companies in all sorts of fields, as well as startups in fintech and um, other startups. Uh, the, we don't have a particular focus in only working in particular sectors or industries. We follow our clients, and in some cases, we hope to lead our clients into new areas. And from our perspective, Claire and I are not technology lawyers. We create financial markets and financial systems and help people deal with the risks in those systems. We come at this from the perspective of our startup clients and our financial services clients are heading in this direction. And really our work is about making it easier for those people to understand your world rather than trying to be experts in the technology world trying to understand finance. So I'm a, a senior associate that works with Scott in um, primarily the background is in a derivatives and financial market space. Um, I've had experience in London before moving to Australia and helped a lot of clients throughout the global financial crisis in sort of 2008 onwards. So I have seen a lot of contracts when they don't go quite so well and the sort of turmoil that, that comes from that. Um, and from helping our clients in this, in this space is how um, I've really got into more of the smart contract and fintech area as, as well. So can you tell us a brief history of how your team got interested in smart contracts and how you ended up doing the work on DNA contracts? Yes, we can. And it, it requires, unfortunately, you to just listen to us for a moment to explain what we do in our day jobs. Uh, what, we, what we do in our day jobs in, in working in financial markets is we work in a legal code already. We already work in legal documents that don't have verbs. They just have series of uh, words and then numbers listed down the page. The reason, the reason for that, the reason that the international derivatives market works in that way is it already must be globally standard. The risks are simply too big to have lawyers getting in the way by using their own words in many circumstances. So we, we already have trained ourselves over many years to work in what legally can be a relatively automated environment. Once you move to the idea that this analog legal code that we have been immersed in um, can have some of its best elements done by something far more efficient, you can then see how we get involved in smart contracts. We do not think that smart contracts need to be left to simple things. We can see the role that they have in a much bigger marketplace because we can see a direct analogy to what smart contracts can do with computation and what 
you know, for the last 20 or 30 years, we have been doing with words in the financial marketplace. Once you have that transition, you can see why we need to help be part of the future. And that led us into what would we do if we had this technology and applied it to our world? What, what do you mean exactly? Like, you'll have to excuse my, my ignorance of legalese, but what do you mean exactly when you say that your the contracts that you write don't have verbs? Uh, I, I, I literally mean that. And so, the, the, the for, for example, um, the idea behind derivatives contracts is that you don't need lawyers. Uh, and so the, the verbs are all standardized and contained in separate documents which are, are never touched. And what you really play with is turning switches on and off and then adding particular words which trigger other functions which are written in these separate books which are standard right around the world. And so the actual, if you and I were to do a derivative, we wouldn't have an argument about whether something was reasonable or payable or all of those terrible lawyer words. We would have an argument about whether it starts on this date, whether the interest rate is payable on this basis, and whether these are the right numbers to be used. Uh, and that is a piece of paper we would exchange with each other. Everything else is already agreed internationally on the base of what effectively we would call a code. And it's, it's kept in code books. They're legalese code books, but they're standard so that you don't need to use lots of words for each transaction. Okay, so if I if I can make the analogy then into sort of uh, into the you know the development world, uh, and, and you know, we have all sorts of open source libraries and open source uh, applications that we use, and so some of these are standard uh, and just sort of standard functions, and then a lot of times configuration uh, is is in a separate file. So what you're saying is that derivatives contracts, for instance are standard all across the world, the way that they operate and the way that things sort of happen uh, within the terms of those contracts are standardized. And then all the parameters uh, of those contracts are then written in separate documents that reference the initial contracts. So as you mentioned, you may have, you know, dates, amounts, interest rates, uh, that sort of the parties involved and that sort of thing. Is, is that sort of a good analogy? That's a very good analogy. That's that's exactly kind of as, as it is. Um, so yeah, so so we would in in our traditional derivatives world we would import those um, definitional booklets into our particular contract just like you would in your kind of open source world so they're all standardized so we would just import the ones we need in we don't even have to write them out we just in include them by reference so it's just like importing a library into a in, into some code that's that's really fascinating. I had no idea that that's how uh, actually it worked. Uh, okay, I, I have no whole new view of like the legal system now <laughs> and lawyers. Um, so tell tell us what are some of the core issues that uh, uh, with smart contracts that you're trying to address? Probably the 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 <clears throat> core issue is that if you use smart contracts in a broader context into amounts and relationships which really count uh, in the non-technology world, i.e. you're playing with other people's money and other people's futures, then there is always a need to consider the context of the society you're in. You're going to have to deal with the framework that we as people deal with each other. And what I mean by that is if Claire and I were to do a derivative together, our relationship is not limited to that derivative. And if some things happen which we can't predict and our history in dealing with the financial crisis and other crises before that tells us there is always some things that can happen that you can't predict, then human judgment and human discretion is invaluable to get the right way out of it. I can say that with, from a, a, a perspective of real experience, Prior to the financial crisis, we worked on lots of derivative products, which were very heavily mathematical. Some of them, the algorithms that were part of the legal contract were 80 pages long, and that was just algorithms behind it. But those algorithms, however complex they are, they couldn't respond to the most simplest of problems. For example, if Claire became bankrupt, then we would have to have the outside world imposing its own rules on what our relationship was. 
and whatever we had agreed would happen wasn't as important to the rest of society uh, for the rules of that society. In other words, smart contracts, if they're going to be used to a real size um, in a real society, do need to have some respect for the laws of that society and potentially get the support of those laws to be really effective. So what you're saying is that uh, in in this particular case, so if uh, you gave the example of you know a derivatives contract between you and Claire, if if Claire were to be bankrupt, then uh, it's the the rules of what need to ha- what needs to happen in that particular scenario is no longer uh, uh, a part of the standard contracts uh, that you mentioned earlier. We have to come back to sort of um, national laws or perhaps some sort of arbitration that uh, is not defined by law, but it's uh, um, perhaps is defined, is, is, is uh, rooted in negotiation between the two of you. Is, is that about right? Um, yeah, I think there's, there's two parts to it, really. There's elements of derivative contracts that do already talk about what happens if something so bad happens. But a lot of the time it's left to the discretion of the parties as to whether they want to trigger that result within the contract itself. Uh, and that level of discretion is extremely important and extremely desired by um, a lot of people in the financial markets whether they wish to trigger that event or not. The second thing is, yes, um, there are national bankruptcy provisions in many jurisdictions, probably pretty much all, that quite often will come over the top of a particular contract and say, no, this is not the way it's going to happen. It's going to happen in in another particular manner. Um, So there's kind of two elements to that, I think, really. So our audience mostly is uh, people from the software industry, uh, code, etc. So can we walk through an example of one standardized derivative contract in which under certain circumstances, human discretion becomes important and we cannot engineer human discretion uh, discretion out due to whatever reason? One example. Sure. Why don't we we use the complex example of actual default? Yeah. We'll step through that. So uh, we, say Claire and I have an interest rate swap, which is just an agreement that Claire will regularly pay me money based on one interest rate, and I will regularly pay her money based on another interest rate. Uh, the, the idea behind that derivative is that as time moves on, um, it actually has real value. One of us gets to win and lose, depending on how the real world interest rates have moved, different to what we have originally agreed. And that means that were one of us to fail, to not be able to perform, um, it could be that uh, one of us has lost a contract which was worth real money to them. And so what happens in the derivatives marketplace, what is agreed between uh, most of the participants around the world is that, say, I was the one who failed to pay because I was bankrupt and there's no way of making me pay when I'm bankrupt because the legal system will make any payment from me at that point void regardless of what we had agreed because we can't contract out of that in, under our legal system is Claire would have the right because I was bankrupt uh, to finish it all now to, to close it all off and to say actually what has to happen is I should just pay Claire the value of the transaction which which it had at that time but the important thing about that is if you only had the information of that contract And if you only had the information on the interest rate derivative market, you would not have the right basis to make the decision for Claire as to whether she should actually pull the trigger on me. That is dependent on whether I've actually, in addition, loaned Claire's money. It would depend on what the rest of the book that Claire has, the other derivatives that she has, actually are doing at that time. It would depend on how Claire herself saw the interest rates in the future. And if the contract itself terminated automatically, Claire would be deprived of something of real value because the marketplace truly values the ability to choose. And that's called optionality and it's worth a lot of money. And so that is an example where an unpredictable (coughs) event has occurred because Claire obviously didn't think I was going to go bankrupt or she would never have done the transaction with me. But the idea that you could predict 
and then presumably encode all the possible inputs into Claire's decision to continue or to terminate our relationship seems from our history and our perspective of dealing with people who make these decisions to be a bit beyond what is possible in the information set that most people have. Claire, would you like to add something? And I mean, I think that's that's exactly right. It gets back to the point about discretion and the optionality that is really valued with um, the clients that, that we see and the financial markets more generally. That option whether to trigger that consequence, to trigger, okay, yeah, I want to shut down this whole relationship or not, is really, really key. And it's, it's valued possibly beyond all else um, in some of these contracts that, that we deal in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's probably one other thing that we should add here, which is a clear demonstration of, of perhaps a difference in thinking between uh, the analog marketplace and perhaps a digital marketplace. In our world, you can choose not to perform a contract. There are consequences to that. You will have to pay damages, but it, it, it's, it doesn't mean you get sent to jail or anything. And there are really good circumstances where you may choose to not perform a contract because it suits your life to do that. And you understand the consequences and you're happy to pay them. That is an important right that real people have to adjust their legal rights to the real world situation they're in. If everything were automated, then real people should ask, well, how am I being, how am I being compensated for the loss of that right to choose between continuing performance and paying damages? And that's not something as lawyers that we can take away from our clients unless they have agreed to give that up. And that's the way we see uh, issues around complete automation of contracts is to be aware of what you are giving up by doing that, not just be aware of what you might be gaining. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a cryptocurrency wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now there are two cryptocurrencies that matter at the moment. One is Bitcoin and one is Ether. But using them can be tricky. What wallet to use? How do you secure them? Where did I leave my umbrella? It's all a big mess. And that's where JAX comes in. JAX is a unified wallet. It works across all your devices. It works for the Android phone, Apple iPhone. It works for your desktop computer. And they have browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And it works for both currencies at the same time. It works for Bitcoin and it works for Ether. One of the things that makes Jax as delightful as walking through the 5th arrondissement of Paris on a Sunday morning and getting a whiff of fresh pastries is uh, how they leverage HD wallets. So they use a 12-word single backup seed for all three currencies and make it super easy to sync your wallets across all your devices. So if you're using the Chrome extension or the desktop app, you just can whip out your phone, scan the QR code, and boom, your wallets are synced. And plus, uh, the people at Jax take your security very seriously. It's open source, so anybody can look at the code. And plus, they never hold any customer funds. All the keys are stored locally uh, on the client side. So go to Jax.io, that's J A X X.io, download the Jax wallet right now and understand what it's like to use a next generation wallet. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. I would actually like to take a, a different example, and uh, and and maybe if if if, the, if that's a wrong way of thinking about it, then you could correct me, and that would help us. So, so the example I thought of, and when I read your paragraph on human discretion being important for the performance of multiple contracts, I thought of a typical home loan agreement. So, so let's say, um, Scott, you're the bank and, uh, and I come to you as a customer, right? And I, I want a mil, uh, 1 million Australian dollars, right? Uh, for a home loan. And I agree to pay, let's say 4,500 Australian dollars per month over the next 30 years. We do the contract. Everything goes fine. Two years later, I lose my job. I'm, I'm unable to pay the 4,500 Australian dollars a month. Now, as per the contract itself, as per the loan agreement itself, uh, you have the right to come and foreclose my home. But that might not be the optimal move for you because maybe you see in my situation that I'm going to get another job in three months and I'm going to be able to repay you back then. Or it might be the case that like interest rates have reduced 
and you want to renegotiate with me a different contract that stipulates a lower monthly payment so that I can end up paying it. So even though you have the power to foreclose, you would want the option of being able to foreclose or not foreclose. And this is the human discretion that we need in the performance of, of this contract. Is that, is that a good example? It is an excellent example. Uh, the, and it is a true example. The amount of times that lenders choose not to immediately exercise all of their rights far outweighs the amount of times that lenders would immediately exercise all of their rights. It's a business decision of the lender as to which path will allow them to one, recover their money and two, potentially continue to have you as a client in the future. That's a decision that they have to make at that time. And exactly as you have mentioned, you and I can't predict now, we can't predict what those circumstances are, we even less could we predict all the possible reasons why it would be a good idea to not foreclose on you because there's effectively a limitless number of possible, possible things that could happen in your life, which would mean it would be a very good decision to uh, give you a bit more time to refinance uh, and to not uh, immediately exercise the rights. That, that's right. I mean, and essentially the person who's lending you money um, doesn't really want to own a house. They just want to be repaid their loan. Owning a house is, is not really that useful for them. Yes, they may sell it again, but it's it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort for them. So there's always that part of the decision as well that, that is taken into account. Like, yes, that that is a, a consequence that can happen, but um, it's to be taken in light of, of all the other factors that are out there in the world. In, in this particular scenario, the, the decision to not foreclose uh, could be a, a, I mean, it, it could be a business decision. So it could be based purely on, um, on sort of, uh, you know, rational um, principles, you know, like, I want to continue to uh, bring in revenue from this loan or it could be uh, empathetical, right? It could be, uh, well, you know, this um, this person is in a difficult situation and so I, I, you know, we will uh, be lenient in accepting perhaps like an agreement in which they can pay in a few months. Um, it, it seems like the the, the, the sort of rational business decisions could be automated in, in some way, but that the sort of empathetical, uh, the ones that are based in empathy or maybe it's not even empathy. Maybe it's, as you mentioned, like I want this person to be a client in the future, uh, which all, you know, comes, always comes down to being a business decision. What sort of, um, wh where's the threshold, I guess, where these things can be automated uh, where, where does it cross the line into like, this can no longer be automated. This has to be a human decision. Where, where do we establish, uh, you know, in, in the DNA contract, um, you know, the, the, the human intervention switch has to be turned on. Uh, just to add to that, there also could be a range of inputs beyond our relationship because one example of what will lead to a decision to either foreclose or not foreclose is what does the rest of your portfolio of loans look like to completely different people? And what do what does the economy of the country that you are currently exposed to look like? So what we saw as being, and, and I should say, this is part of the fundamental value that we think we are contributing is just to point out that there are decisions which we can't see can be simply computed. And so the point that we get to is, where is the efficiency frontier where to collect all of the possible inputs that would go into a computed decision on this point would be inefficient because of either the computing power or the simple huge number of data inputs that you'd have to collect and trust makes it far better to move it to a more efficient computer 
being the one inside someone's head rather than try to mimic the decision tree that someone is going decision tree is just bringing in so many complex inputs some of which would not have even existed at the time the original contract was drafted yeah that, that that's right i mean the way we look at using um computer technology to um kind of improve or change how how we currently see contracts in the kind of traditional space is through okay how can how can they be improved whether that be through efficiencies through speed um or, or through reducing error um so it comes to a trade-off between between those things okay when are we not doing that anymore when is it actually not any any more efficient and it will be different in every different type of, of contract you'd have completely different considerations for for instance for in our world a derivative than you would in say a home loan like it would just be it would really depend on the type of product that it is but it's the same kind of um decision to be made is okay well what is not efficient anymore and, and what is actually not leading to a good outcome okay and i think one one other interesting trade-off that it, it's it's important to mention here specifically in the context of smart contracts as we imagine them in something like ethereum or a blockchain is anonymity uh that is one of the uh uh sort of i guess objectives of uh, uh of, of smart contracts of ethereum smart contracts is that you can interact with uh with uh, you know participants uh, in a completely anonymous way if you wish uh, that 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 is sort of what what uh, blockchains have made possible. In this uh, case, if you're reverting back to some sort of an analog human subjective decision, uh, you have to that that is a trade off. You you, uh, you 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 no longer have anonymity once you enter into that world. Um, what uh, can you talk about some of the different types of contracts on the spectrum from you know, fully anonymous to um, not anonymous, where parties must uh, know, you know who they're interacting with? What what are the different use cases for say full on smart contracts a la DAO to uh, um, you know the tr sort of traditional contracts that we have that we use and we've been using for for centuries, and where DNA contracts fall in the middle? And you, you've touched on a very important point. Uh, because we don't come from a, a tech background, we don't think smart contracts have to be limited to anonymity or platforms which provide anonymity. Uh, we think actually there is a huge amount of leverage to that technology being applied in the whole world of relationships, um, which which some which are documented under legal systems. And so if you and, but it, it doesn't, anonymity doesn't itself mean that a contract may not benefit from having a human judgment applied. It does, it does mean that it could be part of the framework that we won't need human judgment because that's what we're buying. We, we, we know we're doing this. This is, this is what we, we are paying for. We don't want to have the flexibility of a relationship. We don't want a banker to be able to choose to not foreclose. We want to be anonymous. Now, in, in the world of broader contractual relationships of high value contracts, anonymity is not going to be possible because of the regulatory framework that everyone functions in because the regulators and government of the world want to know that huge sums of money are going to places where they think huge sums of money are going. Uh, but when you don't have anonymity, it usually means you have some kind of relationship context, and that's where there is likely to be a benefit for the analog part to actually get value out of that loss of anonymity. When you do have anonymity, it is possible that having an analog context, which doesn't have to be a simple human making a decision, but something which is outside the very structure which creates a problem to solve a problem. So if there is an issue with a system which has anonymity, is it possible that that system could get itself caught in a problem that it can't solve? In which case, is there any kind of safety valve uh, which can be used to resolve that problem? If you think about, if we think about it in that context, that's effectively a large part of what we're doing with aspects of our analog contracts is 
allowing the computational element to call out for help when the computational element has effectively got stuck. And as architects of that at the start, we're trying to build in those areas where we, it is now more efficient to not make the computer just spin wheels, but to actually provide an answer from the outside. So I think that that's right. So so you can have the, the code, you know, ask ask people for inputs when it needs them, or ask some other source for inputs when it needs them, just as just as co contracts do today, and then keep running again. That can be an element of using an analog thing. It's looking outside of the code, and whether that's automated or or not is a different different matter. You can have that automated, but you can also have things where um, we call them kind of hard off ramps, where someone can go in and go, actually, I want to take this this contract out of being fully automated. Um, I want to deal with that with my counterparty now. Now that comes down to, yes, there is no anonymity for that and that you need an element of trust and you need to know who your counterparties are, but there's no reason why you need um, need that in a particular contract if the parties don't want that. So it's touching on again on this question of anonymity, uh, I'd like to get your opinion on on this. If you had the choice, uh, now that we can have anonymous contracts, it's just, I, I think, I mean, unless you can correct me, that this is relatively new, that we can have anonymous contracts, uh, fully anonymous. Um, in, in an ideal world, should we, by default, always try to tend towards having anonymous contracts uh, rather than having contracts in, with par in which parties are known. Um, if, if we had to choose between what the default position would be, should it not be anonymous uh, as, much as, as much as possible where we can automate and then, uh, and then have fail-safes uh, that tend towards analog when, uh, when it's needed? Where we see, uh, let, let, let me speak to that not by me making a choice because it is certainly not my choice to make. But let me just speak to that as to when anonymity has developed in the financial marketplace uh, before this. Where it has developed, which is usually through things like exchanges and clearing systems, is when there is no element of risk between the parties. The risk has already been completely isolated and effectively it has become irrelevant as to who the other party is. No part of what has been bargained for and no part of what has been performed actually is influenced by the existence of the other party. That is a very small kind of contract normally, or it, like very short term, as in I want to buy this standardized thing, you want to sell this standardized thing. When it is used in circumstances of longer term contracts, what has to happen is a super trusted third party has to be inserted in the middle. Because as it goes longer term, people are counting on the contract to actually be performed, which gives rise to credit risk, which normally means I have to know who has just promised to perform this because there is a real risk they won't perform. In those circumstances, what the marketplace, what the people who consume these services ended up creating was a super trusted party in the middle who would effectively perform in the place of everyone else. And so really what I'm getting to is in choosing whether to make it anonymous or not, we again have to work out whether what we're giving up by way of information is important to the contract that we're entering into. It might be critical to the contract if we're actually counting on someone to do something, because even if the contract says the money is paid, once the other side has gone into bankruptcy, you have to give it back. So even if you try and hardwire rules of performance into a computational contract, under most legal systems, you'll end up in the same spot as you would if you tried to hide hardwire something into an ordinary contract, is you just can't contract out of our legal system which means that there are some risks, which means that information about who you're dealing with could be relevant to the way that you price that deal because you can understand the risks you're taking. So we, we've been talking a lot about, uh, about, about DNA contracts since the beginning and it occurs to me that we haven't really 
sort of define what the components are uh, and, and actually what DNA contracts mean. So uh, let's um, maybe let's let's dive in a little a little deeper and and uh, and explain what <laughs> we've sort of we sort of have, but uh, a, a briefly explain what a DNA contract is, what the different components are, and how those components interact. Sure, sure. So, so DNA stands for digital and analog, basically. So it's it's one contract that comprises two sets of terms um, that do different things. One being a digital set of terms, which which operates through automation through code, and another set of of we we've called them analog terms, which is you know kind of legalese terms, terms in in kind of writing. And the, the idea being, and, and we've taken an interest rate swap as an example, just, just as a proof of concept to see if it, it works, um, is that the easy bits, the bits that provide for calculations of amounts due. So the calculations between the parties that Scott and I discussed earlier um, based on different interest rates, that can be done by a computer. So that can be put within what we call the digital terms. But there's sometimes bits that you need discretion for. So if, for instance, I failed to pay a certain amount, which gave Scott the right to terminate the contract should he want to, we leave out of the digital terms. We say, no, that, that's better for a human head to decide whether to trigger or not. That's in the analog terms. Uh, uh, and so you go through each of the terms of the contract and you, you make that decision when, when you design sort of architecture for it, whether something can be automated and if there are benefits in speed, efficiency and, and reduction of errors um, in, in doing so because a computer will efficiently and effectively perform the same calculations again and again and again better than a person can do it. So um, we've then decided that actually what, what you end up with is during the normal life cycle of um, this interest rate swap or quite often a lot, a lot of different contracts, nothing bad happens. The parties perform their obligations and the money gets paid and the contract ends when it's meant to. And all that kind of stuff is actually pretty useful to be automated where it can be. But it's all the bad stuff that takes up quite a lot of traditional contracts. What happens when something goes wrong? Um, all the discretions, all the commercially reasonable wording and all these sorts of things you see in a lot of, lot of legal writing um, takes up quite a lot of the contract, but that stuff's really important, but actually it requires a lot of discretion. And so we've kept that out of the digital terms. Um, there's some elements of the digital terms that also pass um, questions or, or things to be answered over to a human and then can continue operating again. For example, one of the payments under an interest rate swap is calculated by reference to a floating rate of interest, which is available uh, on a particular, we've chosen a Reuters screen. So the code goes off um, and, and gets that rate from the Reuters screen. But what happens if Reuters doesn't publish that rate on a particular day? Well, the code then goes, okay, I can't get that. I'm gonna go and ask a particular human, it's called a calculation agent in our circumstances. The calculation agent determines that rate in accordance with uh, the analog terms. We've told them how they are meant to calculate that. And then they put that back into the code and the code carries on working again. So that's an instance where you have a human intervention because um, it's, it's easier to do so. And then the, the code carries on working and tells the people how much they need to pay on a particular day. The, the, one of the critical things there is that the provisions which are encoded are not just a way of executing the contract. They're actually, the terms of the contract at that point in time. Yeah. So we don't see the D bit as just being a way to make the A bit happen. We see the whole thing as quite a smart contract because the relevant terms are written in the relevant language at the time they are best used. Mm. They are written in a digital language and they are the terms of the contract when it is most appropriate. And then those terms move it to an analog contract when those terms are not appropriate. And the critical element of this, which comes from our background, is it is very important that these terms match what happens in interest rate swap contracts, which don't have this uh, technology. Because what is fundamental to the derivatives marketplace, because the sums of money are so huge, is you can't have basis risk between the terms of 
a DNA interest rate swap and another interest rate swap, which is just on, on an ordinary basis. So we, we wrote it so that you would actually have computer terms, but then we had to make sure that those computer terms actually matched what the rest of the world did, because when you're dealing with billions of dollars, the smallest difference could produce an enormous cost for someone if the market moves in an unusual way. That's right. So the, the, the analog and the digital together constitute the one single contract for that particular interest rate swap and can form part of the larger relationship that the parties may have using, say, traditional contracts as well. So when you say analog terms, I, I imagine like an English language document. And when you say digital terms, it's it's code. And then you have ways by which these two refer to each other, right? Like when I look at the digital code, I can know which document is the corresponding analog term. And when I look at the analog term, I can know which is a digital term. And how is this linkage made between code and English language prose? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So yes, you do, you have the English, English language prose um, and it refers to, in, in our exa example, it's, um, fairly rudimentary but we just refer to uh, digital terms having a particular hash and the same in the digital terms we prefer to the analog terms having a particular hash that they speak together um, but the idea is that they don't try and overlap so the digital terms do one set of things and the analog terms do another set of things and there shouldn't be conflict between them there should be a seamless pass between what a human needs to do in the analog world and then back to the digital terms and vice versa um, over time if if needed with the idea being that actually if nothing bad happens there's no need to really look at the analog terms particularly because the contract will execute uh, through the code. I was going to add something which will probably won't appeal to all of the technology people that are listening to this but the way we explain it to non-technology people and particularly because we're from Australia and so everyone swims here it is literally like you're swimming in the fast lane at a pool which is obviously the computer lane because it works very fast, you run into someone in front of you who's not swimming very fast, so you move over to the next lane, the analog lane, because there is a blockage, and then the terms of the contract actually move you back into the digital lane uh, as soon as you get around that blockage. And so you move from swim lane, from digital to analog and back, and really the, what we've done is work out, well, when should those transitions occur based on our experience in the marketplace, and then how those transitions should occur um, based on, again, our experience in the marketplace. So to actually make it make it more tractable for the audience, because I, I suppose not all of us have, I, I guess maybe none of our audience has ever dealt with an interest rate swap before. But to make it more tractable, uh, I would actually take the example of the DAO, the, the DAO that, that basically had all, all the money stolen. Now, when you look at the DAO contract, the DAO contract had this special role, which was called a curator. And a curator was supposed to limit the number of proposals that were going to be considered by the DAO shareholders through voting. Now, so this curator was like a human that was supposed to study all the proposals that come in and somehow apply a filter on these, these proposals. Now, what ended up happening in the DAO was um, that the role of the curator was not expressed in code at all. It could not be, right? Because it, it needed human discretion. And the DAO didn't end up defining the role of the curator in an English language document. Now, the problem here is in one future day, it might could have been the case that the shareholders did not agree with what the curator did. And because they didn't have an English language contract defining this relationship between shareholder and curator, that would have led to conflict and probably, you know, in the future, uh, stalemates of various kinds. So what a DNA contract would do rather instead is you define the role of this human input giving curator in English language. And then you also define what happens when the shareholders are not happy with the curator and how they can be fired in the analog world. But when the relationship is working fine, the DAO code can handle handle that uh, execution of that organization in an automated fashion. So when everything is going fine, you use the automated code. When there's a conflict between how a particular human is 
satisfying his role correctly or not satisfying his role correctly then you go into the analog world sort it out there and then go back into the digital realm and their dna contract allows this switching from digital to analog and back yes and and i suppose the addition to that is that agreement as to what the code says when it's operating is what we agree and then what the curator says is also what we agree so that is part of one agreement that is quite important because that means that you shouldn't be able to argue that i don't like what the curator did in circumstances where well you agreed up front either that he could make his decision as it sees fit or whatever or in accordance with certain rules and th this is again um, in our background where we, we work with complex derivatives that often have very complex indices which have someone exactly like a curator, this is quite familiar to us. But we do make sure that people agree to everything. They don't just to get to agree to the ordinary life cycle of a transaction. They have to also agree to the default mechanism. And that, that's important because that means that they should understand not what will happen when the unpredictable happens, what not what the result is, but they should understand the process that you have to go through. And it's not it's not an outside process. It's part of what you bargained for. And, and that is quite an important thing uh, in from our world constructing complex things. And we think it's quite an important thing when uh, computations are used in complex things as well. So one thing that occurred to me yesterday when we were talking about this with Mayor is that even in a scenario where you may have a human intervention, let's take it back to uh, you know this idea of mortgage and uh, uh, you know that one of the parties, so the the lending party, uh, the, sorry, the borrowing party uh, filing for bankruptcy. Uh, so I mean we have this contract, uh, it's being executed automatically, and at some point uh, the you know the uh, the analog. Um, uh, component is invoked. Uh, some decisions are made in so the real world by subjective um, uh, inputs, and then we go back into we go back into the automated uh, system. And uh, having dealt with uh, uh, living in France, I have to deal with administration quite a lot. Uh, it's uh, sort of the uh, flagships here in France is that you know uh, uh, everything is everything is very complex administratively and sometimes you have to go back on decisions so sometimes you have to provide paperwork and uh, that paperwork maybe isn't processed correctly or maybe you provided the wrong paperwork and decisions are made and then you have to come back on them so how would that um, how would that work then in that case where you know we go back into automation land and then we we discover that oh we made a mistake we we have to come back and we have to revert these decisions. Uh, how would that work? I, I obviously can't speak to the complexities of French administration, <laughs> although that that did sound pretty tough. What you just said. Um, that that's part of the ability to lift out, lift the contract out of the computer lane, in circumstances where you you haven't even the computer itself the, the computation hasn't done it itself but one of the parties has said or maybe both of the parties have said we need to lift this out to fix something up now the the reasons you don't have to define all the reasons for that as long as you come from a starting point of we want our world to be better not we are trying to create something where the computation framework is always the one applying so for all sorts of reasons, you may need to lift something out and adjust something. And believe me, we see this all the time from our world too, where we have to adjust transactions, not because people are having an argument, but quite the opposite. They need to adjust the mathematical terms of a derivative because that's actually not what they wanted to do. And so the ability to move it effectively from the fast lane to the slow lane again, so we repair the fast lane and then push it back, is always there. Where that would be potentially unacceptable is to people who don't accept that we should ever have an ability for the parties to readjust the settings. Um, in the world of financial markets, you've always got to allow for that because it should never be set and forget because the future world is too unpredictable to have set and forget. 
Um, but if you're if you're if you just want to improve what currently is the case by pushing as many things into the fast lane as you can, then the fact that you can sometimes lift out into the slow lane to fix things up, that's just fine. Um, because you, what the advantage is, is you're only in the slow lane when you need to be. And for everything else, you're in the fast lane using computers to do the work. Let's take a short break to talk about Hide.me. You know you need a VPN provider to protect yourself against those nasty hackers trying to steal your private information. With Hide.me, it couldn't be easier. You just install their application on all your devices, iOS or Android, log in, and you have a cushiony, cozy tunnel in which your data can move freely and unencumbered, all the while protecting you from those mean old hackers. Now that's boom. To sign up for the free plan, go to hide.me slash epicenter. The best thing is when you use that URL, if you ever go premium later, you're going to get 35% off and premium comes with unlimited bandwidth using up to five devices at the same time. You can use all their servers worldwide. You can pay with Bitcoin. And best of all, it comes with a feeling of peace and satisfaction, like having tea with the Dalai Lama. We would like to thank Kite.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Let's bring it back into the blockchains. Uh, now, one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, core components of blockchain technology is digital signatures um, and uh, the ability for you know, parties in a contract, in a smart contract, to uh, execute uh, decisions based on those signatures. So that could be issuing a transaction, uh, that could be uh, issuing a vote, that sort of thing. Uh, now, when you think of a DNA contract and uh, having to make decisions in an analog sense, uh, those decisions have to be made by uh, parties, right, in, in the contract. So if, uh, coming back to this idea of a mortgage, uh, if we have to come out of the automated lane to the analog lane because we need to make decisions about someone's uh, financial situation, um, it is up to say the bank to make that decision and then bring it back into the automated lane. Um, do do you, do you envision that uh, these terms would have to be defined uh, in the smart contract before it is issued to the blockchain? My, I guess my question is how how do you um, establish uh, who gets to make those decisions? Is that based on keys that would be published in the contract prior to it being uh, executed on a blockchain? I think that, that that's probably right. Um, I mean, we come from, from the background of trying to integrate the kind of legal relationship into contracts between parties and not the kind of more technical side of exactly how the, the technology would fit together. But that from our understanding is how you would you would be looking at doing so. Um, you would agree up front before you put the contract on a blockchain, you know, the circumstances in which people could go in, whether that just be at any time a person can go in and pull it out, that's fine, but you've agreed that up front. Or it could be, you know, in these certain circumstances, the parties can go in and, and change things or take it out. Um, but whatever you do, you would need to agree with the parties at the beginning that was going to be the deal. That's, that's right. We're not, we're not trying to impose any kind of inflexible idea in, in that regard. It becomes a question as to, given how much you want to agree like that, how efficient has the use of the blockchain still become? Is it still an efficient use, depending on the fact that you have now got so much complexity in the underlying contract that the amount of time it'll spend in automation is not really worth the efficiency gains that you would otherwise have from um, executing that contract in that form. I'm getting the idea that there's a spectrum. So you have completely traditional contracts at one end, then you have these DNA contracts that are a mix of smart contract automation and traditional contract pros, and then you have pure smart contracts. So there you can think of it as a, as a spectrum, right? And maybe some, some relationship agreements, such as a non-disclosure agreement, should should always be in the traditional contract form because there's not much to automate here right whereas uh, some something like an interest rate swap or a mortgage falls in the middle where there's part part they're partly automatable the cash flow is automatable 
while uh, while the default scenario is not and maybe there is a third kind of possibility as well where a pure smart contract is the best and these might be situations where as you pointed as you pointed out uh, that participants want to transact anonymously and their uh, performance and obligations don't depend uh, on each other that tightly so maybe there's a there's a spectrum and like we are going to see all parts of these this spectrum in the future but uh, in terms of the dna contract uh, what the question that comes to my mind is we are that you are really proposing a new kind of contract technology something that's at least today non standard maybe in the courts maybe maybe the contra- dna contract has never been challenged in in a, in a court so how are we sh- why why are we sure and how are we sure that this linkage between analog and digital instantiated to the mechanisms of hash functions etc will stand up to scrutiny when one of these agreements inevitably find their way into a into a court process uh, the reason is because this is just a progression from what we've done before this is just a progression of contracts that were upheld in the financial crisis under the most rigorous scrutiny that you could have because this is just a mechanism for describing the terms of a contract in a different and i would say heavily mathematical language we write parts of our contracts in mathematical languages already we have to because the marketplace we serve speaks in that mathematical language that stands up in court provided it is clear and provided that uh, there are sufficient experts to tell the court what that means what we're really talking about is um, parties can agree the terms of their contracts such that those terms in being expressed in some form it could be any form of computational code are more easily performed but the area of challenge to say that because that part of the contract is expressed in this language rather than that language is really to say that if i had clause 13 expressed in french in an english contract an english court would strike that down no what an english court would do is find out presumably from someone who speaks french what those words actually meant because that's what the parties agreed the same applies to this we we are not trying to um choose a technology we are not trying to change the fabric of contract law we are just trying to demonstrate that that fabric can be adjusted to fit in with an automated world without changing the very nature of contracts themselves and we know that the very nature of contracts themselves can be upheld because it is every day clear you have something to add there no i mean you will have the same questions that come with any contract so you know do the parties adequately understand the terms are there unequal bargaining power between the parties those questions will still remain so i don't think that it would be any different because you've expressed part of it in code those same questions will be well do both parties understand the code and are they in an equal bargaining power to understand the code that's just the same as as as, as do they understand this algorithm in this contract today or is this contract too complicated for you know a retail investor for instance if you're investing in certain things you'll still have those same questions and indeed claire that's a really important point the question is not um are these things always enforceable i believe the right question is whether the expression of part of the contract in this language makes them any less enforceable because you are not looking for a benefit from increased enforceability you are looking for a benefit from increased efficiency and you are hoping that there is no shortfall in enforceability which has occurred as a result so it it's not intended to produce the nirvana of everything will work all the time it's intended to keep that as a level playing field but produce the added benefit of having the computational code active when it is most efficient yeah awesome i'm 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 really glad to hear this answer because uh, it means it means like there's there's not a big roadblock 
at least on that side for this for this technology so uh, i think in the final section we would like to cover some of kind of the like business and technology aspects um, so one of the first question is uh, originally when when the ethereum ecosystem was built this idea of smart contracts came the uh, the fundamental driving force or the motive force was the perceived need to remove trust from financial agreements mm-hmm. and many people debated that this this wasn't practically possible like in a loan agreement when scott is lending me a million australian dollars there needs to be a bit of trust on my side that i will repay because if you go on the other end where if you completely smart contractify the process then i would need to put all of the monthly payments in escrow but that would defeat the purpose of the loan because i don't have the money today if i had the money today i wouldn't need the loan right so you cannot remove trust from a traditional loan agreement and like loan agreements are such a huge part of the economy right so there's a big parts of the contract economy that you can't make trustless but whether right or wrong that was the initial uh, motive force for building smart contract technology now we are coming to this point where we are saying okay we do need trust and we have to accept it and go for analog terms now but what becomes the kind of business proposition for dna technology what do you think it can improve and why do you think the market would adopt it if it's not the removal of trust that's uh, that's an interesting question because as you have rightly said we we come at it from a different side and it really comes down to the point as to what we think what we see a smart contract is being and in essence we think a smart contract is a contract that doesn't need lawyers very much so the lesser contract needs lawyers the smarter it actually is and certainly the more efficient it is and indeed that entire framework i described for the international derivatives marketplace is designed to not lead lawyers all uh, all the time so from this point there is a slight difference in the philosophy potentially between a benefit of having a smart contract and the benefit from something like the blockchain as an engine of trust um and we don't think we're imposing this difference we think this difference exists in the very nature of the transactions you're dealing with um as lawyers we don't get to change the world and the way people transact um when we do try to do that it becomes um we have to be very careful because people may not understand that what they once had is not what they now have but in in this regard uh the mortgage is because it has pushed back an obligation of someone so it no longer is a trade now it is a payment now for something in the future automatically create some sort of risk and that's what i would be being paid for had i lent you the money is you would pay me interest as being the price of the risk i was taking on you now that means that there either has to be a level of trust because that's a fundamental part of that transaction or we mitigate that in a way which effectively negates the entire function of the contract and that's what you said and like you, for example you giving me collateral to make sure you would pay the contract that would be pointless because i'd ask for a million dollars of collateral please so i think think the point there is in considering what can be moved to anonymous we are also considering of which transactions in the outside world have tr- have trust as a fundamental part of them and then the question is do we want smart contracts to be involved in improving that world accepting that there is still going to be an element of trust or do we believe based on some philosophy that because trust must remain we should not try and improve that part of what people do we because we see efficiencies in what people do think that you should make things more efficient even if you don't remove the element of trust but it might be that other people think that that's um not the best use of smart contracts our belief is lots of people will think that the more safety the more efficiency the more convenience is very much worth um taking a look at applying smart contracts to what they do today's magic word is analog a n a l o g 
head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So if we bring it back to uh, to you know recent events and and the Dow, uh, so recently we there was the Dow hack as you mentioned and you point out in your article uh, as sort of the the the, the base uh, for this whole discussion uh, about bringing human intervention back into smart contracts. Um, in in a, in a way, we could see the hard fork as you know, bringing human intervention because these decisions were made outside of the blockchain. And then essentially we had a fork and uh, which changed the nature of the code and allowed uh, DAO investors to, you know, take their money, bring, take their money back out uh, of, uh, of the smart contract. Um, can you give us uh, your, your views and thoughts about this, you know, from, from perhaps from a, from a legal perspective, from, from, from where you stand, uh, what, what, what do you think about this whole, this whole DAO uh, attack and and the resulting hard fork. That's a good question. Let me express that in um, wording from from my world. Uh, the the result of the hard fork uh, is very similar to the result of to result if that had happened in any kind of centralized financial market infrastructure. If we look at the DAO, like look, like any blockchain, it effectively from our world is decentralized financial market infrastructure. It's a way that people connect to transact, and that's what we see as, as that. Now, were that sort of thing to happen in something that had a clearinghouse or an exchange with a regulator looking over the top, there would be intervention, which would be governed by the rules of that exchange, where the clearinghouse or exchange would say, just a second, that's not the result that's supposed to happen here. We are going to change the rules so that the money is going to go back. And what was interesting from our perspective is it seemed that the hard fork process achieved a similar result, although based on our readings of what was happening in the press, there seemed to be a little bit of of angst and pain in getting to that result. And the the potential for um, that sort of result to be, uh, or that sort of process to be set in advance is something where, which is more analog than digital. So I think your analogy to say that the hard fork is more analog because it is something outside um, the original rules of the coded contract, or so I understand, is very accurate. And I think the, the reason that it occurred is also very instructive as to when sometimes you need to look beyond the source of a problem in order to solve it. That's really interesting. Um, we have one final question and then we'll close down what has, in my opinion, been an awesome interview and a very educative interview. Um, the question is, so today, like DNA contracts, are, let's say in their infancy, right? Uh, there's probably not, not a lot of them around in the market. Uh, <laughs> but let's, let's assume a future scenario where they grow out of this infancy and maybe trillions in dollars of derivatives and other contracts move on to this form. How does this change uh, the legal services industry? What what big change do you anticipate seeing if this technology were to succeed? I think that it will require us as lawyers to be more aware of different ways that people communicate their transactions. What this has taught us already is not that we need to be uh, know all the complexities of computer code because we always see ourselves as more as architects and engineers, but we do have to understand more of the language that engineers will speak in order to work with them. Um, so what it does for lawyers, I don't believe uh, it will remove the need for lawyers, uh, and I don't. I'm not saying that just because I'm I'm a lawyer but it's because of my belief that the law is just a reflection of what society regards as its rules and society will always want some rules that people can't contract out of. We're all part of a society. And so I think there'll be a need for lawyers, but the lawyers will have to be adaptive enough to work out when we engineers could, and I mean, software and computer engineers could implement this far more effectively 
and then being able to speak in a language that those engineers can understand so we can get out of the way and let them do their job and do their job well. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think I think from my perspective, it also goes to what you said about there's a spectrum. There's a spectrum of, of things that, that, that is desirable to automate and there's, a thing, there's, there's things that are not and there's everything in between. And so um, I think, you know, lawyers are just there to be flexible. So they're there to be flexible, to be able to understand the interaction between both sets of terms. They're there to understand the interaction between when something should be automated or could be automated and when people don't want it to be. So a lawyer is really just a product, I think, of, of that and will have to, to change and adapt accordingly. But I, I agree with Scott. And, and again, I caveat saying that it's not just because I'm a lawyer. I think there will still be a place for lawyers for a very, very long time to come. I would tend to agree as much as uh, I like the idea of, uh, uh, of you know, automation and, 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 and blockchains and smart contracts and all this fascinating technology. I think that, uh, you know, in, in, in the current system, uh, I do agree that I think lawyers uh, will be around for a long time. I don't think that anybody going to law school right now will have any lack of work in the coming years. Uh, so just before we wrap up here, let's... Uh, I mean, you've written uh, a paper about this, uh, which we'll um, have in the show notes. All, all of all of uh, the documentation about uh, uh, DNA contracts and the examples that you've given are uh, available on GitHub. Uh, and I'll have links to that in the show notes. Uh, what is the current sort of technical implementation of this? Uh, are you speaking with any developers about perhaps building a blockchain uh, which would incorporate DNA contracts? Um, at, the, at the moment, everything is just open source. It's an idea. We um, are really looking for people's feedback as to what, what they think. It's just something um, that, that we happen to think is a good idea um, from our experience in the marketplace, and we're interested to, to, to get feedback from, from other people. We're looking to expand it into different kind of product areas as well to see how flexible the structure can be and where that level of, of automation versus analog is desirable. As, as we said, it will be different in different types of, of product. It's not just limited, I don't think, either to financial markets products as well, although they are a really good test case, I think. Um, in terms of what we, who we're working with and stuff at the moment, we're very much just just happy for things to be out there. Um, there, there. There are three people that are looking at it closely yeah. in their in, internal systems we know so far. And um, I'd have to say we've attracted an enormous number of friends that I didn't know we had <laughs> in different parts of the world with, who, who, who are more from potentially your background than our background and they do seem to be tinkering with it. Mm. I should say from our perspective, we're not, we're not looking to have KWM developers doing mm -hmm. this because again, I come back to the fact that we serve our clients and so it's really a question as to um, them determining that whether this can be useful for them uh, and then us trying to respond to that and work out how we could make changes to make it even more useful. That's right. Great. So we'll we'll have uh, links to all, all of that in the show notes, and we definitely look forward to uh, seeing how this develops. And you know, maybe uh, at some point this gets incorporated uh, you know, technically into some sort of blockchain where we can we can have uh, you know blockchains that that uh, in the current system uh, in the current legal framework would uh, would uh, be able to. Uh, work with things like mortgages, things like swaps, uh, derivatives, et cetera, which I think probably is you know, very well needed. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks to the both of you. Uh, it was a fascinating discussion. Thanks to the both of you. It was, it was great. Thank you very much for having us. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for, or to our listeners for tuning in. We release episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can find us on the LTB network at less.bitcoin.com where you'll find all kinds of of uh, great content about blockchains, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, decentralization, Ethereum, all that stuff. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at Epicenter BTC. We're also on YouTube. You can uh, download Epicenter Bitcoin with your favorite podcast app on iTunes or Android. We're also on SoundCloud. And of course, you can leave us a tip and our tipping address will be in the show description. And if you're looking for one of these t-shirts, uh, you can get that uh, by getting giving us an, uh, an iTunes review and just send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will get one out to you along with some stickers. 
Thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.